Hello and welcome to Cheetah TV. My name is Brian Badger from the Cheetah Conservation Fund. Now as we continue our journey through the fascinating world of holistic conservation that's operated by the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia, in Somaliland and in fact around the world, today we focus on environmental education. And I got a chance to catch up with an old friend of mine, Ignatius Davids, who's an environmental educator with the Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia, a very un unique individual and a very passionate educator for the future conservationists of Africa. Now, don't forget, if you want any more information on this subject or any project that's operated by the Cheetah Conservation Fund, then please visit our website at cheetah.org. There you'll find lots of information, lots of free downloads, and also you can learn how you can help us keep the wild truly wild. Now, before you leave, if you wouldn't mind just leaving us a like and subscribing to our channel, it really does help us grow. Now, in the meantime, let's hop across to Namibia and catch up with my old friend, Ignatius. So, hi, Ignatius. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Brian. How are you doing? Are you doing very, very well? Are you okay? Yeah, in these very strange times. So, Ignatius, you. you've been with CCF a long time now. So, how, how long have you actually been uh, with CCF in Namibia? I've been it was CCF uh, since 2010, and I went away 2013, and I came back again 2014. Since then, I haven't been gone <laughs> from CCF. <laughs> yeah. So your main main role is uh, is educator. Is that right? So you're you're educating all types of people. Yes, I am. I am an environmental educator with CCF in our education department. And we are we're school kids and community members. Okay, so you you educate both the, um, the, the the groups that come into CCF, but you also go out um, on 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 school trips and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes, we have our mm -hmm. we have our educational programs that based at CCF grounds where school kids will come and visit us and live with us for weekends or a day visit. And then we have our outreach educational programs where we visit the school groups outside of CCF. Okay, so when the groups come to you, say for the weekend, what, what type of things would they be doing? What, what would they be learning? Uh, what CCF has actually done is that CCF has uh, sort of a curriculum uh, based educational programs for the school groups. And with these school groups in mind is that it correlates with actually what they're busy with in their school at that time, uh, being a predator education, being wildlife education or conservation in general. And so we would be looking at teaching them about cheetahs in particular, but also looking at a holistic approach to predator conservation. That is basically what we will be doing with school groups coming in at our center. So typically how big is the group when it comes in for that weekend? Due to the uh, availability of our accommodation, we would with overnight school groups, we would expect them to be not more than 35. And with school groups coming in for a day visit, they could be 200 kids coming in here. Right. We could accommodate them. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's how the, uh, the sizes of the school groups would range. From overnight school groups will be a bit a smaller group. And then day visit school groups will be a huge group from 100 to 150 kids at once. It's probably a stupid question, but... But do, in general, do the kids enjoy that weekend? Oh, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. The first day, it's very much, uh, they, are, they, are, they, don't ex they don't know what to expect. All of them come with their own expectations. First of all, there is fear involved due to the fact that it's a predator. Mm -hmm. And then there is also the safety aspect of it involved that they are now in an environment which is out of their comfort zone. So I always like it Saturday afternoon 
how all of these have just disappeared, how all of these have turned into a really amazing, fun, field, educative uh, program that they had throughout the weekend. So the first day is my most exciting day, and I can pick up on what are they, what are their ex expectations from us, and how are they feeling at this moment. And then on Saturday, when we have a full day's educational session, I will just see how it started to change. That's 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 what I like about the weekend programs. Right, and and, and we know that um, we've had you know, uh, school people that are being on, been on school groups that have come along and, um, you know, they, they've, that's sparked their interest. That's kind of caught them. Um, and they've got the, got the conservation bug, you know, because they've been exposed to it. So, you know, sometimes when you're looking at a group, can you see that little spark happening maybe? I, I have experienced that spark with these school groups, uh, Especially, I can make an example of a group I had about two years ago. And this group of kids, most of them wanted to, I remember clearly I had three boys who really just wanted to be wilders. And after the weekend program, they told me that we wanted to be wilders, but I see that conservation really makes sense to me. Even though welding is also a very important tool to have, an important skill to possess, but they saw that, no, it, they could relate to the cheetah being in Namibia, being around them, coming from a farming uh, environment, or not even necessarily having a farming uh, 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 environment, but coming from a city. And they could see that, no, it starts to relate how important this is for us. And they have emailed me back, actually last year and say that, oh, we have done with our matric and we are actually in college now doing wildlife conservation programs. And I could see how these educational programs have changed um, that and uh, created that spark that Brian has mentioned. Mm. So when you, without CCF, um, I mean, that's just probably one of, of, a, of a thousand, you know, uh, uh, kids over the years. So without CCF, they wouldn't get that exposure. They wouldn't get that understanding, that kind of hands-on um, that, 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 you know, would drive them forward and, and change their beliefs or their, the myths or, or whatever goes around. I, I, would, I would really agree with that. Uh, due to the fact that CCF is a different form of, a different way of really getting the message out there. It sometimes looks very formal, but it also looks very exciting and, and, and enjoyable. There's a lot of scientists there. Not all of us are scientists. Not all of us can, can, can read these scientific papers. We can read it, but not all of us can understand these scientific papers come, coming out of CCF annually. So this department, I feel, has a very important task in taking that information and demystifying it for the public, the layman that did not go to school maybe, or is not, did not go through to a, a tertiary education that's able to understand these uh, publications and, and, and making environmental education enjoyable for them, making environmental education understandable to, to relate to environmental education. I feel CCF has, has that, uh, that secret weapon. Um, uh, that they have created and, and it's working. It's great to hear the, 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 the point where um, you say that, you know, if you don't know the answer to a question, then, you know, you know somebody who does and stuff like that. And, and that's, that's great because um, I always say that the first sign of strength is being able to show your weaknesses. You know, I don't know is a, is a perfectly, um, you know, acceptable answer, you know, but you can't just leave it there. So you can, and, and, and in fact, you're almost educating yourself at the same time. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> yeah. So when you, when you go out, uh, I mean, Namibian history has always fascinated me uh, and the different people. Um, and I know we've, we've had long chats about um, all the different um, peoples around Namibia um, all the different ethnic groups and stuff like that. 
So when you when you go out, I mean, you 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 travel quite long distances to to visit these schools. Um, I mean, what, what what's the longest journey that that uh, that you you tend to make doing school trips? Um, we have we have we have we have our local schools here, which I would just go in there, drive, have a thirty minute or forty minute drive, mm-hmm. then I'm right at school. Uh, the longest distance that I visited was a school that I visited in the Oshiherero district or the uh, Ochitua district. It was quite far. It took me about a day, a full day. And that was not the, the end of it. From that full day, I had to go deep into the villages. It took me another half day. So in total, it, it was about, I would say, 17 or 12 hours mm-hmm. of getting to that school. Yeah, And I would see that really, sometimes you would ask yourself, but why? Is it really necessary? And the moment you get to that place, it makes sense to you. And it, it makes sense to you in a way that it was necessary uh, to leave your family behind, to leave your friends behind, and travel way deep, deep, deep into those villages to visit those schools. Just when they see us, that, that glow that these kids get, the excitement that the teachers get, uh, the appreciation the principal gets to say that somebody is thinking about us to visit us this far, these remote places. And I know CCF always does that. And, and that puts a deep satisfaction to our, our, uh, our, our hearts and, and the work that we are doing. And it also makes the education almost more valuable, you know, because there, there's such a, um, there's such gratitude and stuff like that. So, so I, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, um, you know, the, the schools in, in, in the rural areas, the, the, like you say, the, the ones that are really uh, away from um, the towns, um, I'm sure that they are just like sponges, you know, they just want that education. They want that, that's, that so there's a real desire there. And when there's uh, when there's a desire, you know that's when you really start getting results. So so it's great to hear that. So when you're when you're out, um, obviously you're dif- uh, you're visiting different um, groups, different people. So maybe you, you were saying Ochi Herrero or, or or Avambu or or Damara people. Um, so is the education different with these with individual groups? Do you have to? Um, address it in a different way? That is so true, Brian. That is definitely so true. Uh, We all have the same, um, we all live in the same country. Mm -hmm. We all run through the same educational system, uh, being it private or being it a public. But uh, we have noticed that the, the culture plays a very important role in accepting of uh, 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 this, this, this programs of us. Let me make, for example, uh, when I visited Opuo. Opuo is, uh, it's, about, it's about, let's say about 300 kilometers from the center. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then from Opuo, I had to travel about 60 more kilometers into the, the, the Himba villages where the Himba live. Now the Himba, they are such an intellectually gifted people when it comes to the environment, the natural environment. You yourself as an educator would even be like, what am I really going to tell these people that they don't know, really know about? Because they are so ingrained into their natural environment. Uh, so, so, but they would be so excited. They would be like, wow, we did not know something about the Oshitotongwe, the Chira. Uh, we did not know this and that about the Chira. We know that Chita lives around us. We know we'll, we live from our environment. Uh, but, but some aspects of stuff that you have, we did not know about the Chita. For example, that not all Chitas are there to kill prey. Not all predators are there to kill prey. But if I look after my livestock, it will make it difficult for this predator to come to my livestock. So little things like that, they start to, to understand. Uh, when I go, into the city uh, where there is not a lot of farms, where I get to the city kids, 
they have the technology they have the google mm-hmm. uh and and and, and <laughs> the funny thing is that when i give a presentation some of them will already google me or, or google this information that i'm giving them <laughs> and <laughs> they would be like but say you missed out on a point here and i'm like Oh, what did I miss out? And they say, this uh, information says this and this. So I could see the dynamics, the different dynamics of, uh, of groups that is more, that has, that's technologically advanced or that has uh, uh, able to, 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 to get technology or that's able to use it versus a group that really do not even have a touch screen or a smartphone or a laptop around them. So I could see the dynamics in, in how they are definitely uh, uh, perceiving or receiving our our educational sessions uh when i re- travel to uh, uh some of the group states that's uh like my tribe i'm from anama um uh we are also very much environmentally conscious uh we love our wildlife but we love the springbok more <laughs> i don't know for what reason uh but uh we would see that uh, sometimes we would have you would have the groups that that has a uh, numerosity against a predator that has, they have this perceived hatred or perceived fear against a predator. So as an environmental educator, you, are, I'm not there to change their mind. I'm there to give them the information and allow them to change their mind on their own, to make sure that I gave them the correct information for them to take the decision to say that really, this has really, really changed me. Uh, so you would you would you would definitely see some groups are very much open. They they accept the information. Some groups have built a wall. So as an educator, I have to climb over that wall. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good way of putting it. You know, we have to we have to get over the wall, round the wall, or under the wall as long as <laughs> the other side. <laughs> yes, it's fine. <laughs> we would talk about plants. Yeah. Plants. Uh, we will talk about trees, the importance of trees, the cultural aspects of trees, how important trees are to us culturally, what we do with these trees. Uh, we will talk about grass uh, spores or tracks of animals. And, and, and they will start to click. It will start to click. And my favorite part is talking about the termite mound, taking them to the termite mound and showing them they have seen termite mounds, Brian. Don't get me wrong. Okay. They know what termite mounds are. But when you go and talk about the ecology of the termite mounds, that's when it starts to get exciting. So that really helps a lot to take them into the field and also having them in the classroom. I, you, <clears throat> you've just sparked some memories for me um, because I remember when when the... Uh, <clears throat> the the universities came in to study termite mounds, and I just thought, what you know, it's a mound and termites live in it. You know what's you know what's to study, and then I started to learn about you know the 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 even just the mechanics of the inside, how it develops, how it changes, the almost like the air conditioning and everything like that. And I was totally hooked, you know, and, it, and it's you, you, the, the example that you just used there where, yeah, the kids see them all the time. So therefore, they're not important. But <clears throat> that little bit of deeper knowledge, again, that little spark being um, be, being started. And, and, and I was a victim of that as well. So you're never too old to learn, obviously. <laughs> So when you're when you're out in the bush, because obviously you you you've been in Namibia all your life, you've you've travelled the country, and and for one reason, um, what still excites you when you're when you're out? You know, so because what 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 kind of takes your breath away when what, what, when you see it? I I love two parts of my country. I don't know what there's something about the desert. I love the desert in my country. It always blows my mind every time I visit it. Um, because the desert for me, it looks like there's no life, but life happens around us all the time in the desert. If you have that eye, but if you start to open that eye, you will see that all the time. And, and, and that always blows my mind. 
um, when because I asked my my daughter once, what's important about the desert? She said, it's a bad place. And, and it just struck me like, really? And, and, and I took her to the desert and I showed her the trucks the beetles will do. I showed her what they do here, what life in here is. And that's one part of the desert that always blows my mind away. Uh, the other part is the savannas here in our area the trees um, uh, where CCF is situated, this area that we have, this farmland that we are situated, how, how, how beautiful it can really be uh, with the deep bushy or what bush block is doing uh, and, and it, how it's just restoring this environment. So I, I like the two dynamics of Namibia where there's nothing growing and then there's another part of it where there's so much growing. <laughs> So it's it's I I'm I'm always fascinated, even though I was born here, by these two dynamics of of my country. <laughs> I I completely understand, you know, and it's just giving yourself the time to stop, you know, look, listen, and understand, you know. In it, and it's uh, I think we're all guilty of not just stopping, just stop, look, you know, and and appreciate. And I think there's a there's a lesson to be learned for all of us there. So so Ignatius, I, I know that you're gonna you're you're just about to hit the road again. Um, so I want to thank you very very much for um, finding the time to talking to us today, and uh, we wish you um, all the best and safe travels. And I know that traveling around at this time is isn't the easiest thing in the world, but you know you're. Uh, you're very innovative and, and you'll find a way because that's just another wall that you have to get over, get round or get under. And I know that you'll do it. I've got every confidence in, in you to do it. So thanks for everything you do. What you do is fantastic and, and, and so, so important. And hopefully we'll get together again and maybe cover some other areas of, of, the, of your fantastic country of Namibia. So Ignatius, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you very much uh, for this indeed. And I really appreciate seeing you, seeing how young you get all the time. <laughs> and <laughs> But I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And please take care, everybody. Okay. We will also be safe out here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If you want to learn more about that project or any of the projects that CCF are involved with both in Namibia and around the world and also to make a donation or to sponsor a livestock guardian dog or a resident cheetah, please visit our website at cheetah.org. Now, if you like the video, please leave us a like and subscribe to our channel. And you can also set the reminder for further episodes on Cheetah TV. Thanks very much for joining us and I'll see you again next time.